Hello to everyone. This is Ray Ross from Financial Literacy 101. Today I'm with Stephen Gardner, a four-time best-selling author of one of his most famous books and most recent book is Taming Wall Street. I've been lucky enough to get anywhere, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of his time to answer some of your most daunting questions dealing with the economy and most importantly, the stimulus packages. Okay, so Stephen, one of the most thought out and sought out questions on my in my community is are we getting a second stimulus check yeah that's the that's the most common question i'm getting with my own community um i i personally think that there will be a, a stimulus uh you know i'm shocked at how hard the senators are working to confuse us on whether there will be one or not right so one day they're saying uh, if there is a stimulus, and there most likely will be, <laughs> and then they say like, well, it's highly likely that there'll be another stimulus, but we can't say for sure. Um, I, I think in the end, they are going to have to realize that a large percentage of Americans have been deeply wounded by this shutdown. Most people were not prepared to go into hibernation for 60 or 90 days. Um, about half the country lives paycheck to paycheck. And so we all were, you know, compliant with trying to flatten the curve for 14 days. But now, come on, we're getting close to 90 days. 90 it, days. It, it's getting kind of ridiculous. So uh, the other thing is, I, I think that they're going to realize uh, that people are going to go back to work and that the businesses are going to reopen and nobody's going to have surplus money to spend. And so if they, you know, it's like opening a pipe and no water flowing through it does no good, right? So they, exactly. Need, exactly. they need cash flow flowing through the economy, through households. Uh, and, and I don't think the stimulus has to go on and on forever. Uh, but if they're going to keep the economy closed, then they need to keep the money flowing to the people or else, I mean, we're going to end up in worse than a great depression. So, exactly. but uh, the, the thing that makes me mad is it appears that the Senate and the House are playing a game of high stakes poker. Uh, but instead of playing with money, they're playing with human lives. And that really makes me mad uh, because I know how many people are suffering. Like right now, the, uh, the ability to evict somebody, that has been lifted. And there are going to be tens of thousands of people evicted from their apartments and homes. And in the next 30 days, if something doesn't happen, there's going to be millions of people evicted. I mean, we're, well, they've we're, got to we're do something. Already, yeah. And we're already talking about 40 million Americans that are unemployed currently. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and, you know, I'm writing a letter to Donald Trump right now and to the Congress. And part of that letter is that you guys aren't accounting for the people that are now underemployed, right? I, I know a lot of people in my neighborhood, they're like, oh, thank God I still have a job, but now I'm only working 30 hours a week or 20 exactly. hours a week, or I've had to pick up a second job or, you know, I work 20 hours at my normal job, but now I'm doing Instacart or Grubhub or something just to make a little Your extra dad, money. Yeah. You're absolutely correct. Which, um, you know, what actually uh, leads me into my second question for you, Stephen, is that what will recovery look like in the new economy? What, what, you know, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, so uh, as you study the Great Depression, um, it, it fundamentally changed an entire generation of people and the way that they behave with money. Uh, I think we might see something similar. Um, if they reopen, I don't think we'll have the same issues. Uh, plus, we have these stimulus programs and things that they hadn't thought of over 100 years ago. But um, I think people are going to have to rethink their relationship with the risk of the stock market. Um, I think much like we saw after the Great Depression, people are going to have to put a, a greater emphasis on saving money and having an emergency plan. Um, my firm right now, I've already seen a huge shift in people saying, hey, uh, instead of paying you to lay out a, a plan to be wealthy, can you help me lay out a plan to pay off my debt faster? And, and so they're paying our firm to, to help them and, and it's going really well. But I've seen that shift already in a 60-day period of, of the way people are thinking and planning. Um, I think that we'll also see uh, the way that people behave with debt and with their money 
I think that is going to change fundamentally. So it'll be really interesting to see, but those are just a few thoughts that I have uh, right now. <laughs> if I just may add, and I, I totally understand because when this new economy happens, there's going to be even more Americans in debt and uh, people like you and now, we're going to have to be really busy to help these people and pretty much build the economy with financial information that's going to help them to get out of it. Yeah, oh, abs um, absolutely. Um, I hear that sometimes in life you, you have these, these problems with finances and the information is not always accurate from person to person. What do you think or say when you hear people say everyone should have been better prepared for financial hard times? Uh, yeah, I, I've been hearing that a lot in my channel feed among friends. Um, you know, I, I think everyone's gut reaction is to say, I should have been better prepared or you should have been better prepared. Um, but, you know, right, right now is not the time for people to beat themselves up, right? It's not like they can get in a DeLorean, go 88 miles an hour in a, a mall parking lot <laughs> and go back in time and tell themselves, hey, just so you know, you need to have a bigger emergency fund, right? So yes. they, can't tell them, they can't tell their past self that, but what they can do is they can tell their future self, hey, when we come out of this, we're gonna do it different and we're gonna do it better next time. And so uh, something that I'm trying to point out to people on my channel is you can't hate yourself into being a better person. You can't no. hate yourself into a better financial position right now. So when the economy reopens, my hope is that you know a channel like yours and a channel like mine, that they will stick around and continue to get that financial education that financial literacy so that coming out of this, they can do better and be better because they know better. I agree. I agree. That's really good information, Stephen. I'm, I'm actually glad that we had the opportunity to do yet again another video um, with a lot of insight about financial knowledge and information. But if you, if you have one strategy, one thing that you believe that most people overlook, what do you believe that could help them? Oh, um, I, I think one of the biggest habits that we've lost sight of, it, whether you're on the lower end of income or the higher end, the, even on the higher end, because many of my clients are, are you know, wealthier, but uh, we've, we've lost sight of this habit of being a good saver. Uh, so I, wa I want to throw out a scenario to you. Okay. Did you know that if one person can save $10,000 a year, at 5% compound interest versus someone who can save $5,000 a year at 10% interest, the person that's earning 10% interest, it will take them 24 years to catch up to the person earning less but saving more. Wow. Now that's 24 phenomenal. 24 years, right? I think I've heard this before. It sounds like cash value... <laughs> well, th this is just, these are just mathematical numbers, right? Yeah. I do have this in my book, Taming Wall Street, because I like to point out the importance of being a good saver. But, but think about that. For those 24 years, when people are bragging about what interest rate they got, who gets more attention? It's the person saying, hey, man, I'm making 10%. I'm making double digits. That's but, correct. But what you don't know is the person who's saving more money, even at a half that interest rate, they're going to outperform you in lump sums of money for 24 years. So I, I think- That is phenomenal. Yeah, so I think uh, the money that we can set aside for ourselves uh, is gonna be higher than most investments going forward. I don't think that we're gonna see as high of gains like we did in the last 10 years. Um, is it okay if I share another example? Please do. Okay, so, um, if, and you know, some people can save this amount, some can't. So don't get hung up on the numbers. So just listen to the concept, uh, those that are watching. If you could save $5,000 a year from your own saving and your own effort, that's equivalent to having $100,000 earning 5%. Okay, now think about this. What's harder to do? Save money for yourself or get to $100,000? Save money for myself. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> for, for most people, they never get to that 100000 or it takes them over a decade to get there, right? But if they can become right. a good saver, 
they can put away more than what their, their lump sum investment will earn in a year percentage wise. And so the, the power of being a good saver is, is just so important, right? Uh, we, we've lived through the 10 most successful years of the stock market in history. Indeed. Um, but you know, what are interest rates going to be going forward? We don't know, right? So I, I think that if people can save money for themselves, uh, number one, they're going to have more money. Two, they're going to be able to weather emergencies. And three, there's something that boosts your self-esteem when you say, I'm worth paying myself versus giving it all away to every bill that we have to pay every month. If you can pay yourself first, you're going to get further ahead. So I, I think that habit of being a good saver is going to become significantly more important going forward. I totally agree. Now, I have, if, if, if I can, I have one more question for you in this segment. So okay. I don't want to take up a lot of your time, but I have one more question. And if you will, after that closes out, let people know about your channel and any pertinent information you want to list. So my last question for you, Stephen, is what is the best, I mean, the best investment people can make? Uh, I always believe that the best investment you can make is in yourself, right? So uh, taking courses, reading books, listening to seminars, uh, unless you have a brain injury, nobody can take that knowledge away from you. Indeed. Right? So like I've been through hard times. After 2007, 2008, my wife and I, we had a short sell our house. I was living paycheck to paycheck. I was borrowing money from my mom and dad. But all during that time, I was stacking knowledge on knowledge. I was compounding my skills. I was compounding my habits. I was, I was focused on my goals. And within a few years, I was completely out of debt. I was making more than I made before the Great Recession. Wow. And, and so investing in yourself, believing in yourself. I mean, I have a, a post-it note right here. Okay. Uh, you probably can't see it. But every day I remind myself, I am my own greatest asset. It's not my mm. bank account. It's me, right? And so I think investing in yourself uh, it is the best that you can. Now, if I had to go through this again, <laughs> and you know, some people are like, man, how do you, how do you know this stuff? It's because I lived through it, man. I don't know this from books. Exactly, the experience. I, yeah, I, I, had to, I had to go through the, the school of hard knocks, right? If I, had to, if I had to redo this again, man, I would take any job that I could because I'm going to tell you something. It's easier to get a job when you have a job. So first thing is I, I would get, I would just take whatever job I could and, but I would look at it as a stepping stone exactly to the next job. But while I'm moving to the next job, I'm going to increase my knowledge. I'm going to increase my value. I'm going to increase my skill sets. I'm any job I go to, I tell myself, how do I become the linchpin right now? The linchpin yes. is like, you see like a big Ferris wheel at the fair or, or uh, six yep. flags or Disneyland or something. You pull that linchpin the whole thing collapses, ball, right? Ball, ball you, yeah. Exactly. You have to be the linchpin at your business, in your own business, and in your own life. So that's what I would do is I, I would start looking at jobs as stepping stones to where I really want to be. Uh, but that, that's, you know, something that I keep getting asked over and over again is how would you start over? And that's, that's what I would do. Man, that's phenomenal, Stephen. Um, it's been a joy. Once again, it's been terrific to have you on my channel. Um, I absolutely love the way that you've uh, been doing with your channel as well as all the information that you're giving with people, uh, whether it be money-saving tips, inspirational videos, as well as similar check updates, okay? <laughs> so if you will, if you want to give out uh, an outro to people who may not know about you so you can put yourself out there even more so. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I appreciate you letting me come on and, and speak to your viewers. Um, if, they, if they just search uh, Stephen Gardner, Stephen with a PH on YouTube, I'm one of the first people to come up. You'll, you'll recognize this face. <laughs> um, or they can check out my website, yourbridgeplan.com. But um, I'm on a mission to help strengthen America one family at a time. And if your family's next, then I'm happy to do that. Absolutely. All right, everyone. This is Financial Literacy 101. I've been doing an interview with Stephen Gardner, a uh, four-time best-selling author with the most famous book that is out, Taming Wall Street. Learn money and be inspired. We're out. Thank you. <laughs>